in the previous lectures we have looked at materials with the different interesting uh, electrical properties and uh, we covered on uh, giant magneto resistance we covered some issues on colossal magneto resistance which is typical of a perovskite um, based compound and uh, we have looked at the possibility of uh, tunneling magneto resistance in multi layers and um, one of the other lectures we also looked at the possibility of inducing magnetism and therefore making a semiconductor a magnetic material. Uh, in today's lecture I am going to cover little bit uh, from the materials chemistry point of view on one of the other exciting uh, field uh, which has brought more focus into fundamental issues uh, on mixed metal oxides that is uh, the issue of superconductivity in oxides otherwise not known until 1986. Uh, so, this is a discovery which has almost brought a fresh look at uh, all the research uh, that is going around uh, metal oxide chemistry and uh, uh, the cartoon that you are seeing in the front screen here is uh, a unmanned uh, maglev train which is running at the speed of 930 kilometers which is actually operated using a superconducting coil. So, uh, the fascination of superconductivity can go to any extent uh, right from basic research to uh, the other issues of materials world where we can really feel it and experience it. So, in this lecture I am going to tell you more about the chemistry point of view of superconductivity and what are all the fascinations that we can look in one single uh, crystal lattice. Before I uh, start with issues. Uh, pertaining to superconductors uh, just to familiarize ourselves of the range of materials that we have uh, starting from simple conductors to insulators to semiconductors and uh, then we have a special um, place for superconductors which usually normally behave as a metal. Uh, at a particular point this metal transforms into a superconductor. If you look at the history of superconductors uh, it is almost 100 years since the discovery of superconductor has been made. Uh, it was exactly 100 years back in 1911, Kamerling Onis developed the process of liquefying helium and when he liquefied helium, he found that mercury was going to a zero resistivity. In other words, it shows zero resistance at 4.2 K that is the um, boiling point of liquid helium. Since then this area has picked up and in 1913 Onis was awarded the Nobel Prize for superconductivity and this is one of the first uh, results from Kemmerling Onis where you can see there is a metallic state as you cool the uh, mercury and at uh, 4.2 K there is a sharp drop in the resistance and the resistance is of the order of 10 power minus 5 ohms zero resistance state it achieves as a result mercury behaves like a superconductor. And as you know uh, mercury is one of the metal which is existing in uh, liquid state. So, there have been lot of studies on other metals. So, the search for superconductors at higher temperature has been the focus since this discovery and other metals found to be superconductors are lead at 7.1 K, niobium at 9.46 K and then came this A15 uh, type um, metals or alloys. This is niobium stannate um, um, alloy and then you have niobium germanium all this shows around 1823 uh, Kelvin and maximum superconducting uh, temperature that has been achieved up to 1953 since the discovery has been only 23 K and uh, nevertheless with this finding several useful applications have happened over the years and uh, these metals are malleable therefore, you can make it into any shape therefore, these alloys have been 
made into some device uh, purposes and especially in superconducting coils these alloys have been used and they are applied in even um, NMR instruments. But this excitement lasted only until 1986 when there was a paradigm shift in this um, uh, work or in this field uh, mainly because of the discovery that struck in 1986. Before we look at uh, the major discoveries in this field, I just want to show you that most of the elements in the periodic table do show superconductivity at some temperature and all the uh, ones which are marked blue here those are superconducting at ambient temperatures, but if you actually go for non-metallic uh, regions especially 4A, 5A and 6A elements they do show superconductivity at high pressure. So, uh, quite a good number of elements do show this strange property, but what really was the breakthrough is the high temperature superconductors. In 1986 George Bednors and Carl Müller they are uh, from IBM facility at Zurich they observed superconductivity in a compound which is called lanthanum barium cuprate. It is a K2 NiF4 type of a compound the crystal structure resembles that of a K2 Na4 type and this ceramic compound is actually considered to be a anti ferromagnetic insulator because if you look at the crystal structure the copper oxygen planes which are interstacked in this uh, unit cell they are actually anti ferromagnetically al aligned and the electrical conductivity actually shows it is a anti ferromagnetic insulator. <coughs> so, you cannot get anything out of this compound all you can try to do is you can um, you can try to increase the hole mobility by substituting with some uh, divalent metal in the lanthanum site and as a result you can improve little bit on the conductivity where you can take it from a insulating state to a semiconducting state. This was all known. So, the breakthrough was when you try to cool the sample at low temperatures then you see from the metallic state it goes to a uh, superconducting state. And in 1987 because of this path breaking discovery Benos and Muller won the Nobel prize in the field of superconductivity. The reason why it was path breaking is ceramics are not supposed to be showing any metallic property and it is not just showing metallic nature, but it is also superconducting um, in nature. Therefore, uh, a ceramic which is considered to be a rugged insulator turning to a superconductor has been the path breaking discovery there. Nevertheless, the excitement that generated led Paul Chu and his co-workers at the University of Houston um, to replace some of the lanthanum with yttrium and then they produced another ceramic that superconducts at 93 Kelvin instead of uh, the one which shows at 34 Kelvin. So, it, this was a quantum jump uh, when this discovery was made. Uh, if we now relate to yttrium barium copper oxide you would see most of the applications are now based mostly on this compound which is nicknamed as YPCO or YBCO which stands for yttrium barium copper oxide or some people also nickname this as um, 1, 2, 3 compound because the um, stoichiometry of yttrium to barium to copper is 1 is to 2 is to 3. Therefore, this is popularly <coughs> referred to as 1, 2, 3 compound or YPCO compound and many of the practical applications today in this field is based on yttrium barium copper oxide. Now, if you look at this short history of superconducting materials you would see from uh, finding the superconductivity in mercury um, way back in 1911 as you scan through there is a shift in focus after 1973 since then since then it has always been mostly on the oxide chemistry whereas in the previous years decades you see it is mostly on several phases or intermetallic compounds. So, there is a paradigm shift after 1986 where you start looking at the oxide chemistry in greater detail and as you would see here 
in most of the compounds that are listed we have transcended from 30 Kelvin all the way up to 133 Kelvin. So, the quest is to go as close to the room temperature so that the um, implications of superconductivity can be realized in energy sector and in many other uh, electronic environments. <coughs> if you uh, look at the type of oxides that we have listed here, what you would clearly see is that these are all mainly based on copper. So, these are popularly known as cuprates because the basic structure revolves around copper oxygen planes or sheets. So, mainly this is copper chemistry where this bivalent and trivalent uh, acide cations are providing the uh, required chemistry or the lattice uh, structure for this strange phenomena to occur. So, by and large if you look at the oxide chemistry it is only cuprates and there has been no other report on a non oxide uh, non copper oxide um, <coughs> lattice or compound which is showing a high TC. <coughs> And uh, lastly in 2001 in the past decade we had another strange discovery of magnesium bromide which shows uh, superconductivity at uh, 34 Kelvin that again is a serendipity we will come to this issue later. If you try to mark from the previous table a plot of uh, years versus TC in Kelvin you would see that there are two plateaus one with all the metals a marginal increase has been aimed at and then from uh, 86 onwards you see a phenomenal jump in the TC. So, there are two plateaus for this uh, range of uh, uh, compounds one is to do with the metallics and then you see a skyrocketing uh, influence of this cuprates in increasing the uh, high TC. So, the first cuprate superconductor La2 minus X BAX CuO4 was discovered by Bernos and Muller in 1986 and if you view the crystal lattice in different perception this is what you would see and as you see here this is a nothing but a perovskite. Two perovskite layers are sandwiching a LAO layer. So, you have a two perovskite layers and in between these two perovskite unit cells you have a lanthanum oxide sheet which is separating and that is what you would see here roughly th this is one perovskite and this is one perovskite and the intermediate layer is your lanthanum oxide. So, that is exactly what would bring in the layered nature ok. So, A uh, A 2 B O 4 is nothing but a, a B O 3 repeat with a interlayer AO. So, this forms your K 2 N F O structure and as you would see here this is one unit cell and in this unit cell you have copper in in the A B basal plane and it is not along the C axis and uh, this is the um, A B plane interaction which makes this a superconducting uh, compound. Similarly, uh, yttrium barium copper oxide which actually shows the uh, superconductivity at 92 Kelvin. Um, this also has a very unique uh, perovskite lattice and in this lattice you can see um, yttrium barium copper in 1 is to 3 is to um, uh, 2 is to 3 proportion. So, it is uh, that is why it is called 1 uh, 1 2 3 compound. You can see here these two are the barium and uh, in between you have the yttrium and copper oxygen uh, planes are in the terminal edges. So, basically this unit is actually based on CuO or CuO2 uh, planes or CuO4 uh, pyramidal uh, units. The CuO4 units is what brings about this sort of a crystal structure with the interplanes coming from yttrium oxide and barium oxide. <coughs> so, this is another projection of the yttrium barium copper we will look into the chemistry because what is fascinating from the materials chemistry point of view is uh, is the constituents in this lattice and how when we vary th this 
a crystal structure how the uh, property can be adversely affected. The 90 k 1 to 3 superconductor actually was found by Chu et al. Uh, if you ca calculate the number of oxygen in this uh, lattice you would see that apparently the oxygen vacancies are randomly distributed among the oxygen sites and this unit cell actually has 8 oxygen atoms and this 8 oxygen atoms their ra random occupancy and how they can be taken out of the lattice put inside the lattice will determine whether this particular compound will be superconducting or not. In the next few slides I will show you when we discuss about the chemistry of it how vulnerable this oxygen atoms could be and if we are not very careful in maintaining this oxygens in the preferred lattice sites you will end up with a insulating compound which is uh, not going to even be metallic. So, um, that is the chemistry which is rich in this uh, lattice cell and then we will look at it. Uh, typically this uh, 123 compound shows a very excellent transition and the onset is somewhere around 93 and it goes to a 0 absolute 0 state uh, as close as 90 and if you look at the delta T it is very very small and this transition shows that the whole uh, sample is superconducting and it is not a biphasic compound it is a, uh, a monophasic compound as a result the delta T is very very narrow of the order of just 3 to 5 Kelvin and smaller the delta T then you can be sure that your whole uh, compound the bulk is actually superconducting. You would also find out that if there is a biphasic compound or some impurities are there delta T can be more than 10 K which clearly indicates that there is a insulating phase that is present in the compound. So, what is the phenomena of uh, high TCE and uh, what, what do we learn from here? Uh, when we think of superconducting properties there are three parameters that we need to familiarize our, ourselves and these three are critical to decide whether this can actually be transformed or used into uh, uh, used in the uh, applications and whether they can really contribute to making devices. So, when we think about these three parameters all three are critical therefore, it is called critical temperature, critical current density and critical magnetic field. Critical um, temperature T c is this is not Curie temperature this is critical temperature meaning the temperature at which the uh, substance goes to uh, zero resistance. Uh, so, it has to show zero resistance therefore, that is what we call it as uh, T c and in uh, in such a state what is the critical current density in other words how much of the current that this material can hold it can uh, hold without a loss. So, that measure that can also be measured using physical um, experiments. So, critical current density is one way to map whether your material can be used for application or not and then critical magnetic field is another issue where it, the material can uh, sustain only a particular amount of um, magnetic field beyond which the flux density of the applied field can go into the compound in other words it will remove that diamagnetic state. So, uh, when the compound can repel that particular amount of field that is called as critical magnetic field and that is the strength of your superconductor the diamagnetic state. So, all these three has to be measured. So, when we think about uh, superconducting oxide we need to have these three issues in picture. Now, when I talk about this critical field then the first thing that comes to our uh, mind is uh, the property that governs this uh, superconductor. One is uh, the most important property is the zero electrical resistance and the next one is the anti magnetic state. Anti magnetism is nothing but a diamagnetic state. In other words the material may not be diamagnetic at room temperature, but when you are cooling there is something happening within the lattice which makes this material a diamagnetic material as a result it will expel the magnetic field. And when 
it is in a diamagnetic situation that is below the critical TC point that is below TC it is in a perfect diamagnetic state and in that state one of the manifestation is the magnetic levitation. So, as you would see here this this is a superconductor superconductor actually when it <coughs> kept inside uh, when it kept in a field it will ripple. So, the flux will not permeate through the uh, sample and this is the diamagnetic situation, but over the critical field then the flux can actually go into the uh, superconducting material and this is not the high TC phase. So, in at high TC you would see this expulsion of the flux density. So, magnetic field completely expels due to supercurrents created on the super con uh, uh, conductor and this is termed as an anti magnetic state. So, if uh, the sample is in a levitated uh, situation or in a diamagnetic situation one of the most important manifestation is it can actually lift up a magnet. So, in this cartoon you, you would see this and in the next cartoon animation is there where you will understand this. So, if there is a magnetic levitation then it is actually due to Meissner effect where the pairs of electrons are in single quantum state with zero resistance as a result uh, since they are uh, paired up they attain a diamagnetic situation which will actually ripple the magnetic field. So, superconducting electron pairs move without resistance to counteract the applied uh, field from magnet hence we get this uh, perfect diamagnetism and as a result it manifests with a magnetic levitation. In fact, this magnetic levitation is the true response of a superconductor of any superconductor therefore, the magnetic levitation is one of a very fundamental application that we can derive from uh, any superconducting material. In the next cartoons I will show you a demo of how this uh, um, superconductor works and uh, how this uh, issue of magnetic levitation can be extended to practical application and um, uh, after that we can look at the chemistry of these oxides. So, levitation of a superconductor in a magnetic field if you place a, a superconducting compound on a bar magnet you would see nothing happens when temperature is above TC, but when temperature is below TC this um, <coughs> material is actually lifted up and it can float and this is called the Meissner Oskenfeld uh, effect. Um, which is popularly known as magnetic levitation. You would see in this cartoon uh, a demonstration of how a magnet can float on a superconducting object. As you see here this is your uh, uh, magnet and this is the superconducting compound which is a black um, block ok. And now um, in the cartoon you would see uh, nitrogen liquid nitrogen will be poured into this uh, block. So, you can see this uh, magnet is now actually placed on the superconductor and nothing happens the magnet uh, th there is no rippling um, uh, response there. Now, we can pour some liquid nitrogen on this block and cool that black block which is nothing but your superconductor. So, now the, uh, the material is going to liquid nitrogen state and now if you place that uh, a magnet you can see the magnet is actually floating and you can also see the magnet is rotating. So, there is a field that is expelling the magnet and wh when the material is actually in a superconducting state. Now, if we can take the block out then the material will again come back towards room temperature and in that state you would see that the material does not behave like a superconductor. You can see here the uh, the force that is applied on the magnet, but still magnet is um, <coughs> being rippled by the superconductor. So, the super con uh, currents inside the superconductor con uh, is very strong to throw away this magnetic force. Now, you can see even you can lift it uh, in such a situation and suppose you keep it outside the liquid uh, nitrogen, you can see this black block is now getting um, uh, back to room temperature and as it crosses the critical uh, critical uh, temperature 
then the uh, magnet comes and falls back. This is the Meissner effect that you can see and the critical issues there is that the uh, whole phase the bulk of this material has to be superconducting in order to eject or ripple the magnet. You would see the same manifestation in a uh, in a form of a train where you can realize a floating train uh, using uh, the same issue of superconductor. And here you can see a small engine sort of a um, <coughs> stuff is made and uh, the belt is actually made of a magnet. So, you can see that this engine is actually now floating on the magnet and now we can uh, freeze this superconducting material and you can put it on the magnet pathway then you can see that it is actually hanging on the track. So, if you place the superconductor on the track and if you give a small momentum you would see this uh, high TC superconductor is actually uh, going around the track. You can see here that this single pellet of uh, 1 2 3 compound is actually going and the moment it loses its critical temperature it falls down on the track. Now, you can do the same thing put the black material uh, in a engine sort of a module and we can see how this can rotate frictionless and uh, still it is bound by the influence of the magnetic field. <coughs> And this is the way the magnetic levitation works and this is a prototype of a um, engine, engine uh, which can be operated and uh, uh, this is the module that has been used uh, by this group which is meant to accelerate. The propulsion actually comes from a device which is hanging there. So, when the flotation occurs depending on the propulsion it can go faster or lower and that is shown here. Now, you can again put some superconducting uh, ma uh, material inside the engine and we can try to bring it to critical current and based on the propulsion that you use we can now maximize the acceleration and it can go in any speed and you can try to deaccelerate and bring it again to a control speed. So, both are possible and this is the phenomena of levitation that is useful to <coughs> to apply uh, uh, in many of the applications. Now, let us go more into the uh, structural aspects and find out uh, what is the uh, essence of uh, the superconductivity and what is really controlling this phenomena in oxide materials. Uh, as you know yttrium barium copper oxide is not a um, simple oxide it is a complex oxide therefore, making this material it's a, uh, itself is a Herculean task. Although now uh, any uh, undergraduate labs can even perform this experiment in the initial days it was very difficult to understand the chemistry of this because even if you miss out little bit on the uh, synthetic part you might end up with a non superconducting phase which will be a green compound. So, uh, synthesis is important and then once you have a feel on synthesis you can try to play around with the structure and also on the stoichiometry. So, I will tell you how uh, everything progressed over the years. This is a cartoon uh, where you can find out uh, how uh, critical uh, making this material is and as you would see here uh, this is a thermogravimetry just uh, gives you an idea how the uh, solid state reaction happens you take 0.5 moles of yttrium oxide and uh, 2 moles of barium carbonate and 3 moles of copper oxide and this has to be ground intimately for uh, many hours and then once this is intimately mixed then you can heat this material and the material has to be heated from room temperature up to 950 degree C and during this time you would see carbon dioxide going out of barium carbonate other than that all the other mixtures are oxides. So, once the carbon dioxide escapes then you would see there is a weight loss of say around 13 percent and then the final compound is actually uh, formed here. 
the final compound actually corresponds to y b a c o. But problem here is if barium oxide is also stable then it is easy to take all the component oxides into picture and make the phase much more easier. But barium oxide is very reactive therefore always it ends up with barium carbonate and barium carbonate undergoes decomposition only above 800 degree C. Therefore, the reaction between yttrium copper and barium has to happen only above 800 and the nominal temperature is achieved at 950 degree C. Problem is when the mixture is being heated there are chances that some uh, intermediate compounds can form between reactive yttria and copper oxide and when that happens then the stoichiometry suffers. So, this is the problem with uh, such a superconductor. So, many uh, chemical roots wet chemical roots have been brought where barium uh, carbonate can be um, avoided and reactive barium oxide can be used. One of the convenient way that this has been achieved is take barium peroxide and barium peroxide above 400 degree C releases reactive barium oxide. As a result then above any temperature above 400 you will have a very reactive mixture of yttrium oxide, uh, barium oxide and copper oxide. Therefore, the single phase compound can be made with ease. So, there are lot of uh, intricate issues that are involved in synthesis. I will not run through every detail, but then show you how to make such a um, single phase compound uh, from solid state method. <coughs> Once you uh, take yttrium barium copper oxide and then you heat it at 920 degrees in air uh, for say 24 hours, uh, the first pattern that you would see from the XRD uh, powder XRD pattern is a um, peak resembling something like this. This is corresponding to 0 3 0 and uh, you would see a small reflection here and then uh, the major peak that comes here will be around 32 degrees which corresponds to 1 3 0 and 0 3 1. As you would see here this major peak actually has a splitting and the splitting actually corresponds to. So, if you see a splitting in the main peak then that means uh, this is orthorhombic phase and that orthorhombic phase is actually a superconducting phase. But what would what you would notice here is that it should be O 7 according to this formula because yttrium is 3 plus, barium is 4 plus and copper is uh, in 6 plus because of 3 copper. So, 6 plus 4 13 you should actually get 6.5 as the stoichiometric compound, but you would see the range is anywhere between 6.5 to 7 and that is what makes this um, uh, particular uh, compound very interesting because you have labile oxygens which can be incorporated or removed which controls the superconducting state. Therefore, this becomes a rich chemistry to achieve uh, a fully oxygenated compound good enough to give a clear T C at 90 Kelvin. One of the other signatures that you should follow um, when we look at orthorhombic phase is the splitting and uh, the splitting comes somewhere around 46 degree which is uh, indexed uh, to both 200 or 002. If this peak is a single peak then it resembles it is a tetragonal phase and in that case even this major peak will not have this uh, splitting. So, if there is no splitting then it is a tetragonal phase and if there is splitting it is a orthorhombic phase. So, you can easily map whether you are working at a, a critical oxygen uh, a containing compound. If it is not the orthorhombic compound you can be sure that it is not going to be superconducting. So, you can have finer uh, fine tuning uh, done just by looking at the x-ray mapping. As you would see here this 7 minus uh, x or 7 minus delta is very critical because as you vary from 7 down to 6.5 according to the stoichiometry you can also see how the T c drops to a non superconducting state. When it is a superconductor you can clearly get a 90 Kelvin uh, T c 
and that is nearly as oxygenated compound. Okay. So, where does this oxygen go? That we can see from the crystal lattice if we take a uh, closer look at it. Uh, now, one more thing we need to understand if you do a Tg and Dtg, you, you would find out that it loses oxygen when you heat up to 920 degrees and therefore, freshly synthesized sample at 920 when it is actually cooled down at uh, room temperature it, it will actually be a fully non stoichiometric compound with oxygen value ranging from 6.8 to 6.9. So, 6.9 Y B A 2 C U 3 O 6.8 to 6.9 is very critical for the superconducting phase to occur. You would also see if you do the same T G at 0 0.5 degree per minute and at 1 degree per minute there are many useful inflections that are coming. If you look at their uh, derivative T g graph at n 1 there is a peak at n 2 there is a peak n 3 there is a peak and n 4. So, there are 4 different uh, temperature zones at which oxygen is getting desorbed. So, we need to be very cautious about this desorption that is occurring we cannot control the 730 um, k, uh, degree C because it is at high temperature. Therefore, it is important if we need to achieve this 6.9, we need to be very careful to anneal this compound at 230 because that is where the oxygen exchange is happening. So, any sample which is prepared before we measure the superconductivity, you need to make sure that there is a post annealing that is done at around 300 degree C for a long time. So, that enough oxygens are getting incorporated into the lattice and that is what we see if you do it at a faster rate probably you do not see the N, N1, N2, but there are only 3 zones, but nevertheless N1 is still there. Therefore, this range say from 250 to 300 degree C the annealing has to be done in oxygen annealing in oxygen has to be done. So, that you get a fully oxygenated sample to achieve 6.9 uh, stoichiometry. So, the issue of uh, oxygen content actually brings us back into focus what sort of a unit cell that we have and if we take a close look at it um, we see that the barium ions are uh, placed here and the yttrium ion is actually uh, separating these two uh, perovskite units uh, unit cell and then you would see copper in this n chain and also copper along the c axis. So, this is a copper oxygen unit in the a b plane and you also have copper oxygen unit in the C axis. So, the coordination of this copper oxygen unit actually is different in this case this is of a, a square planar nature and this is pyramidal pyramidal because it is actually uh, getting linked with uh, the apical oxygen. So, two types of uh, uh, coordinations are there um, apart from that we would also try to take a close look at the oxygen occupancy. You would see here this is mainly based on the copper oxygen uh, sheets that are prevailing in the A B plane and there are also oxygens along the C axis and the number of oxygens that were getting desorbed as we saw in the earlier slide denotes oxygen can actually be lost here, oxygen can be lost between these two sides oxygen can be lost here also. So, there are different places oxygens can be labile, but as you saw with each temperature region one particular type of oxygen is actually going. Now, we will see more closely which of these oxygens are labile and how they control the superconductivity and therefore, if you, this is one particular unit cell uh, with the full composition of yttrium barium copper oxide and in this you can easily observe that this is the copper oxygen chains that are there 
these are the copper oxygen chains and these are the copper oxygen planes and their coordination actually is different here. But what you would see that the high TC is actually controlled by the copper oxygen chains which are a CO4 type of units which are placed here. This copper oxygen chains are critical to the high TC and no matter what happens in the copper oxygen plane it does not seem to adversely affect the high TC. So, the core of the superconductivity is the issue of controlling the oxygen stoichiometry in the copper oxygen chains because this is your AB plane. Uh, this is a nice view graph which will tell us uh, where does the oxygen deplete in the first place. Uh, both in the orthorhombic and tetragonal forms uh, of the y, uh, y 1 2 3 the O 6 sites as you would see O 6 sites at the rare earth plane and the oxygen 5 sites at the basal plane are totally vacant. So, that is why it is donated uh, denoted with the uh, squ square here the squares indicate that these are places where oxygens are missing and that is why you get a total number of 8 oxygen atoms because there are enough vacant sites. And in this vacancy the places where oxygen can be easily put and easily taken is this O5 vacancy. The reversible intercalation of oxygen in O1 that is here and at O5 actually amounts for the physical and chemical properties of this um, yttrium barium copper oxide. Uh, and this can be studied used using uh, temperature program desorption. You can clearly find out that it is possible for us to incorporate oxygen in this region. The moment oxygen is taken out of O1 which is your copper oxygen chain immediately the TC is lost. This is uh, another cartoon which tells us how critical the oxygen stoichiometry is and if you are uh, using ammonia uh, as a test gas for ammonia decomposition using yttrium barium copper you would find out from uh, from this uh, plot A which is for uh, YBCO compound and this is for the cobalt doped YBCA compound the oxygen depletion is somewhere around 400 to 500 degree C and this particular oxygen is actually coming out of the uh, O1 site which we saw in the previous cartoon. And the more the lattice oxygen is actually taken the more uh, the faster is the conversion of uh, ammonia to nitrogen and to NO and other related oxides. So, the, uh, the place where oxygen is actually missing comes from the copper oxygen chains. And you can also find out uh, the relative proportion of carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide uh, that is coming out. There is a very steep increase in oxygen coming out of the yttrium barium copper oxide somewhere around 250 degree C. Now, having said that uh, we can actually map some gen general behavior in all the high TC superconductors that are reported. For example, you take the 1 2 3 compound um, Y B A 2 C U 3 O 7 and from there you can see there are 3 other compounds which are mentioned those are bismuth related compounds, but they are nevertheless cuprates and bismuth related compounds actually shows a increase in T C and if you compare the T C with the number of copper oxygen planes in the unit cell you would find out that with increase in the copper oxygen planes from 1 to 2 to 3 the T C is actually increasing from 20 to 85 to 110. So, this is a very clear proof that copper oxygen planes are very critical for the superconductivity. So, copper oxygen planes are very critical for superconductivity. So, when you try to make a material if you can make a repeat of this copper oxygen um, planes then there is a possibility for us to increase the T C, but it has also been found out that the number of copper oxygen planes which can be um, incorporated into the stacked perovskite layer 
the T c actually seems to sap, uh, saturate beyond the 3. So, there is a limiting uh, situation for such stackings because it is possible to decorate such perovskite interlayers with the copper oxygen sheets or planes uh, using some physical vapor deposition, but it has been found that the T c does not seem to increase more than um, 3 uh, copper oxygen planes. Another group of compound that has really attracted interest is thallium based uh, cuprates and uh, mercury based cuprates as you can see the maximum has been achieved for mercury based uh, cuprates which shows T c at 134 k. Main problem with bismuth, thallium and mercury is that they really evaporate therefore, you can end up with a non stoichiometric or non uh, chemically homogeneous compound. So, most of the reactions that are done here is actually achieved in seal tube conditions and that imposes a problem of making this in bulk and that is why yttrium barium copper is still preferred for practical application because you do not have stringent requirements in terms of synthesizing this you can just do it in open air and uh, you can make it in kilogram quantities or gram quantities which is not a problem. Therefore, although these uh, superconductors do hold uh, potential because of their high T c, but because of the processing limitations the applications are very few and uh, this is typically the unit cell of your uh, mercury based mercury or thallium based superconductors. You can see here again the uh, copper oxygen uh, planes which actually control the uh, superconductivity and in between if you can actually incorporate a copper oxygen plane then the T c actually can be mo modified and uh, typically for a mercury based superconductor the T c can uh, can be seen here and uh, they have very high uh, critical current density of 10 power 6 ampere per centimeter square and the T c is somewhere around 130 Kelvin. As I told you um, these are perovskite blocks which can be modified. So, if you can actually th this is a illuminate block and the rock salt block illuminate block. So, it is very use uh, easy for us to incorporate copper oxygen sheets in between to increase the uh, superconductivity and therefore, many uh, compositions have been reported uh, for thallium and um, bismuth based compounds. Coming to the phase diagram then we can understand how critical the doping concentration is as I told you uh, lanthanum uh, I will write it here lanthanum 2 minus x S R X C O 4 actually has the critical concentration of strontium. So, if you actually make a substitution of strontium in the lanthanum site then you can uh, look at the T c maxima and you would find out the T c is maximum only for a critical composition of say 0.15. Beyond that if we keep doping then the superconductivity actually tails down. So, this is the region where you can aim at strontium doping. So, strontium with 0.15 x is the compound which will actually give you maximum superconductivity beyond which you would see it is in a metallic range if it is below 0.15 then it is in a semiconducting like state. So, this is critical for us to understand what is the compositional limit because in uh, strontium uh, content if you increase you can see that it, the, it is fully oxygenated and therefore, the oxygen vacancies are at its maximum somewhere around this region and this is critical for high T c and you would also find out somewhere uh, around this the nominal composition of your uh, copper valency or uh, copper valence state is somewhere around 2.1 2 or to 2.2 which means copper is actually having both copper 2 and some amount is partially substituted with copper 3 plus and that is coming because of oxygen deficiency to bring about the right uh, neutrality charge neutrality some of the copper gets oxidized to copper 3 plus and this is again another um, plot which tells about the oxygen content in uh, strontium doped La 2 CuO 4 
and uh, you can see very well here that this is the superconducting region where the oxygen content is very close to 4 and the TC at is at its maxima. If you actually bring down either way then the TC falls rapidly and it goes into a non superconducting state. So, the incorporation of oxygen in all the cuprates is very critical and that governs also partially the oxidation state of copper 2, copper 3 which is actually uh, affecting the copper in the copper oxygen chain which is in the AB plane. And uh, here again the we see uh, several other ways that we can enhance the TC for all these compounds that we see here uh, yttrium barium copper or bismuth based or mercury based or thallium based. Uh, we can actually try to maximize on the um, uh, TC by applying pressure. This is a, uh, this is not a chemical pressure effect this is a physical pressure effect by which we can enhance the TC. And uh, here uh, thallium based compound is seen here and uh, this is a, a three dimensional plot of TC versus composition of uh, yttrium versus uh, uh, pressure you can see only at critical compositions you can get a maximum TC. Uh, lastly I just would like to uh, bring to your focus that this is one of the recent discovery although it is 10 years old, but this is again a serendipity where magnesium dibromide has been found to uh, show superconductivity at nearly 40 K. And uh, this is a black compound incidentally uh, the group which was working in Japan they did not have the proper starting material to synthesize uh, one of the superconducting compound when they found magnesium diboride in the shelf and they just took that and studied they found that this diboride also shows a superconductivity. Therefore, the game has always been a serendipity as far as this uh, superconductivity is concerned and uh, this is the TC curve which clearly shows a 40 K superconductor for magnesium um, boride and uh, mechanism is it is based on metallic conduction you would see electrons are uh, going through the lattice. Uh, with minimum scattering, but what really uh, governs the superconductivity is the uh, formation of Cooper pairs and this Cooper pairs really govern the issue of uh, uh, superconductivity and uh, how does this Cooper pair formation occurs? Cooper pair is nothing but two electrons going hand in hand they are running through the channels and they induce a super current and this formation of super pair uh, or a Cooper pair is actually facilitated by the lattice contraction here. These are your um, atoms and when there is a distortion in the lattice then a Cooper pair is actually formed. The two electrons called a Cooper pair belong becomes locked together as they proceed through the lattice which gives a strong super current and uh, this is actually confined in the uh, copper oxygen chain which is the cause. And one way to re identify how this differs from a norm normal metal is there is no band gap in this case whereas in the superconducting case because a, sub, a Cooper pair has to form there is a opening of a band gap which is called EG and that is once it is um, taken care then you can get the superconducting state. So, uh, compared to a normal metal how do we identify a superconductor because this amount of 2 delta is actually a narrow band gap opening which is the binding energy of the Cooper pair. Once this is formed then the binding energy of the Cooper pair will sustain the uh, super current. So, the opening of band gap between, um, between the valence and conduction band uh, compared to a normal metal is the uh, in essence the um, mechanism for superconductor. And as you would see here the spin up and spin down bands are given here spin up spin down bands and in a normal uh, metal both at V is equal to 0 and V is when uh, potentially supplied you would see there is a very small variation between the majority and minority spins. Whereas, in a superconducting state you would see that this is varying the spin up and the spin down band they open up a band gap and that will actually give you band gap of this order which will be the binding energy for the Cooper pairs. So, in a typical uh, situation your IV curve for a 
metal will look like this whereas, for a superconductor you would see a opening up of a band gap that would determine uh, whether this Cooper pair can be formed. Applications of superconductor I will just finish uh, with few uh, mention uh, one of the important application is in the field of uh, medical imaging this is a MRI uh, scan where a superconductor is actually used for MRIs and uh, not only that superconductor can be made as a reel this is a uh, tape they call it in this rolling assisted uh, textured tapes you will see the superconductor can be coated and therefore, we can try to render the superconductor not just as a bulk material, but also in tape form and it is also used in Josephson junction and uh, that is where the uh, principle of NMR uh, application is used where squid uh, is actually this is nothing but superconducting quantum interference device which is actually used for measuring very small changes in the magnetic field in local environment therefore, this is actually used in NMR. And lastly as I told you uh, the floating train uh, the trains run without wheels and uh, this is already experimented uh, between um, two states in USA and this is an unmanned train which travels at the rate of 930 kilometers per hour where Meissner effect or the magnetic levitation is actually used to demonstrate this effect. 